Hi guys, and welcome to Gas City Gaming set review of Ixalan. In this video, we'll be taking a look at all the blue cards. Now, if you haven't watched any of the other videos, I like to preface these videos with just saying these reviews are more centered on limited environments, so your pre release, drafts, things like that. Um, if I do think a card is good enough to make it into standard or other constructed environments, I'll say so, but uh, you know, I'm not a Pro Tour player or anything crazy like that, so my experience is more towards limited environments than any kind of constructed, but. You know, I've played around for these cards for a few years, so uh, I just like talking about them and having conversations with you guys about them. I want to know, do you guys agree with me? Do you disagree? Do you think a card is going to be better or worse than I think? Love to hear from you guys in the comment section down below. But let's get to it. Our first blue card of Ixalan is Air Elemental. Air Elemental is a reprint from multiple, multiple sets before. Uh, it's three Jerk Man and two blue for an uncommon creature elemental. It's a 4-4 four, four flying. I've Love the... I, okay, Evasion is good. If you haven't watched the other videos, Evasion is good. I've said that a ton of times before in my other videos. 4-4 four, four for flying is going to jump over your opponent's lines most of the time, unless you're also playing against somebody with like the blue-white or the Esper Flyer deck. Um, flying is always good, because usually the gum, if you played in a pre-release or any kind of limited before, the ground gets gummed up real quick. It gets crowded down there. So any kind of flyer jumps over that, hits... A couple times, that's you know a half, a third of your opponent's life total. You're just going to win most of those games. So air elemental, I'd gladly play a couple of these guys. I've played them, you know, five years ago. I'll play them now and be just as happy about it. Uh, Arcane adaptation is two generic mana and a blue for a rare enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures you control are the chosen type in addition to their other creature types. Uh, sorry, in addition to their other types. The same is true for creature spells you control and creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield. So everything in your hand and everything in your deck is that kind of creature in addition to its other types. Um, so, uh, but this being in blue in this set, it's obviously kind of meant to name Merfolk. Uh, there are a lot of Merfolk buff creatures in this set as well, so that's kind of what this is going after. But um, you could name it if for some somehow you're playing like a blue, green, red um, dinosaur deck. You throw this in there, and all of a sudden everything's a dinosaur. So it could also go in there, but this is kind of meant to name Merfolk. If you have enough things um, that pump, for, we're going to use the example of Merfolk. If you have enough things that pump Merfolk, I can see throwing this in there in your draft or in your sealed. Um, you say, oh, let's make some Merfolk spells cheaper. This All your Merfolk get plus one, plus one, that kind of thing. And you have this. Okay, I can see playing it, but you have to have a lot to make it worth it. If you really don't have a lot of those, you know, crowd support creatures like that, then this isn't making the cut for me in sealed. Standard, if we get a tribal deck that has any kind of blue in it, this is going in there. You know, because all your, okay, your dinosaurs are all plus one, plus one, your dinosaurs are all one cheaper, whatever deck color you're playing this in, this will go in there if it's any kind of tribal deck. This is going to be, uh, I think, a commander stable for sure, and any kind of commander tribal deck that includes blue this is just going to go in there from now forward because if you're uh i don't know i'm saying merfolk i'm just going to use the example merfolk again in commander you know you could play a big stompy dragon oh it's a merfolk and now it can't be countered because cavern of souls right how good is that anyway arcane adaptation sealed you have to have the right deck for it in sealed uh you have to pull the right card so it's more a little more likely in draft because of that if you have to be the only guy at the table drafting Merfolk, for example, and you open this, yep. But other than that, I don't see it going too, too far oh, outside of the casual formats. Cancel. Cancel's been around before. If you're playing a blue control -y deck, you'll play a copy or two of Cancel. It's uh, generic mana and two blue for common instant, says counter target spell. Counter spell was too good, so they attack the generic mana on it. Um, yep, yeah, just like I said, you'll play a copy or two if you're playing that control deck. If not, don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, Charted Course is generic mana and a blue. For an uncommon sorcery, draw two cards. Then discard a card unless you attack with a creature this turn. So a kind of sorcery that kind of has a raid trigger on it. Um, sorcery speed card draw, two mana. So if you've attacked with something, this is really good value. Uh, two mana for two cards is great. Uh, discard, even the card filtering, even if you didn't attack with something, is still good. I'd, I would play a copy or two of uh, chart, the, chart a Course in my, my blue limited deck, I'd be happy about that. Instead of, we didn't get an Anticipate in this set, so this is kind of our, our substitute. We'll see a better one later, though. Uh, Daring Saboteur is a generic mana and a blue for a rare 2-1 human pirate. It's a creature. Two generic mana for and a blue has an ability. Uh, Daring Saboteur can't be blocked this turn. When it deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card if you do discard a card. So, 
you can make it unblockable for three mana a turn, and let's let's you loot. You know, and, but the thing is, it's also early enough. It's a two drop on the play. You might hit with it a time or two, anyways, without being it blockable. And evasion limit is always good. A mana sink like this, okay, every turn. If I pay three mana every turn in a blue deck to do two to somebody, I'll do it. Um, you gotta be careful in this set though, because there are a lot of oh, you know, deal two damage to that, deal one damage to that, and this just being a two one is pretty vulnerable to those. So don't make this your all in all strategy. But if you can drop this on curve, it could be a really good card. Deadeye Quartermaster, three generic mana and a blue for an uncommon creature, human pirate. It's a two-two. When it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an equipment or vehicle card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Now, if you have a really good equipment or vehicle, play this. If you don't, don't. Simple as that. Four mana for a two-two is too much. If you have a really good bomb, equipment, or artifact or something in your deck, play it because you want to be able to tutor for that. Um, and it gives you a blocker so you can play it on the next turn but if you don't have something good like that don't even look at Deadeye Quartermaster don't don't fall into the trap Deep Root Water is two generic mana and a blue for a uncommon enchantment whenever you cast a merfolk spell make a 1-1 one, one blue merfolk creature token with hexproof that was good um, again you have to have a lot of merfolk in order for this to do that, so in the same deck that you're playing our previous rare enchantment in, you're probably also playing Deep Root Waters. Um, you ought to be careful of things that don't have an impact immediately when they come in. Like if you watched our white set review, there's the Adonto First Fort that when it comes in as its enchantment legion's landing, you get a 1-1. So you pay 1 mana for this enchantment and you get a 1-1. So if this made a 1-1 on turn 3, it would be a lot better. I would definitely say play it at that point, especially if you're in your blue-green heavy merfolk deck. Uh, but in your draft merfolk deck, this is going to be good. Sealed, you might not get enough merfolk to make this worth it. So drafts, if you draft the proper deck, for sure, absolutely. Bonus merfolk, hexproof merfolk, also aside from that. Um, but on its own, in a sealed deck where you maybe get six-ish merfolk, and so you maybe play two or three of them in a game, eh, I don't this is not worth it to me in that. Um, if I don't think now with just Ixalan we'll get a Merfolk deck into standard. If we get the same kind of support also in the next set for uh, for Merfolk, then possibly we might get a Merfolk tribal deck in standard. Uh, kind of a control -y tempo, kind of like it is in modern, a tempo deck. Um, we might get something, and if we do, then this is going to be an auto include in that for sure. But right now, no further than a draft deck, I don't think. Depths of Desire, two generic mana and a blue for a blue instant at common. It says return target creature to its owner's hand. Create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap. This is our first treasure token, actually. Uh, treasure tokens are a colorless artifact token that say tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Uh, so with Depths of Desire, uh, it's your bounce spell for now. Uh, return target creature tokens on hand instant, so you can do it when it's attacking you. You can do it on the end of your opponent's turn, so you're free to attack in. Uh, but look at it this way. As, as Say if you play this on four mana, you play this when you have four mana open, it only costs you two. Because you can play Depths of Desire for your three mana, you leave something untapped, you get a artifact that produces any color for you. So then you have two mana free to do something else. Um, if you play this on five mana, you can play Depths of Desire and keep up cancel. Right? That seems really good. Um, so Depths of Desire, I'm happy. Kind of this is... Blue's removal is more of kind of the style of pacifism, or enchant creature, tap... We'll see this later on. Enchant creature, tap it. Um, it stays tapped until this... En you know, it stays tapped until it uh, is ever not enchanted by this enchantment, then it untaps during its controller's untap phase. Um, this is the other kind of blue removal you get, the bounce. And this is a pretty good bounce spell because of the semi-cost reduction factor of you getting a treasure with it as well. Uh, dive Down is one blue mana for a common instant. Target creature you control gets plus zero, plus three, and gains hexproof until end of turn. Um, now, if you've watched the white set review, you saw me talk about pump as removal. Um, cards like Dive Down, because it doesn't add any power, it just adds toughness, are often not removal, but they will negate your opponent's removal. Uh, again, I don't think we got negate in the set, so you won't actually see it, but... The fact that it's giving creature hexproof, well, um, you'll often want to say you play your big bomb, six drop, whatever it is. Uh, you play that, you leave up one blue mana. If your opponent decides to try and pacify it or Ixalan's binding it or whatever they're going to do, try to remove it, you say, no, it's hexproof now. 
for one blue mana. Uh, I've played these kinds of cards before, um, where it gives something hexproof, and throwing one in your deck can save you sometimes. Um, and also just pumping toughness. You know what? Okay, you attack with your 3 2, I'm going to block with my 2 3, uh, pump it, mine lives, yours dies. So, this will not so much remove a creature as either prevent a trade or trade with your opponent's removal spell, which in your blue deck is fine. It's kind of where you want to be with those usually, because blue isn't usually super duper aggressive. Dreamcaller Siren. Two generic mana and two blue for a rare creature. It's a Siren Pirate. It's a 3 3 flyer with flash, and it can uh, block only creatures with flying. When it enters the battlefield, if you control another pirate, tap to two target non land permanents. So, um, you do this on the end of your opponent's turn, because it has flash. You do this on the, your, the end of your opponent's turn, because you tap their flyers, their other creatures, so that your Dreamcaller Siren, and maybe your other flyer or two, can get in. Right? And hopefully win you the game. Um, Dreamcaller Siren is a definite include in any kind of flyers deck, whether that's black, blue, even the black, blue pirate deck even loves this. Black, blue, black, white, even Esper, if you get the mana base for it to support it. Definitely play it in any combination, and even just on its own. 3-3 three, three flyer for 4 flash is great. That's just fine on its own. I'll play that every time. Never mind the tapping ability. The tapping ability is just a staple on that makes it rare instead of uncommon. So, dream color, siren, play it, pick it, have fun with it. Entrancing Melody is X blue blue for a rare sorcery. It is gain control of target creature with converted mana cost X. This is just a mind control. This is not a enchantment that when the enchantment removes, you lose it. This is just, you get that creature now. Um, late game, this is great. Uh, your opponent plays their 5-drop, you know, a couple turns later, you get it. Hopefully you can block it for a couple turns, even if they have a big impactful something else. Um, you know, that's the other 5-drop, because you do have the extra cost of the 2-blue, so you got to pay what they played, plus a little more. Uh, but if you're on the play, you're man ahead of your opponents anyway, so this is just going to get better from there. Entrancing Melody, uh, this kind of effect in Limited and Sealed, the Draft, whatever, can be devastating. It's very, it's has been good enough to get into Standard recently. Uh, but, mm, limited, real good, real, real good. Favorable wins. This is your dream card for your any kind of flyer deck. Generic man and a blue for an uncommon enchantment. Creatures you control, flying it, plus one, plus one. And that's going to, this is going to break the uh, stalemate, the mirror match a lot of times. If you have this, your opponent doesn't. Your 3-4 is a 4-5, there's still 3-4. Go. You know? Um, favorable wins is a reprint, I believe, uh, but it's a really good card. It, this is the kind of this is uh, if you plan on drafting a blue white flyers deck or the blue X color uh, flyers deck, this is something you want. Like if I get a few good blue flyers and blue white or blue black or whatever flyers in that first pack when I'm drafting, I open, I see a favorable wins and kind of a meh rare. I'm taking that favorable wins, hundred percent, hundred percent, because it just sets me up for the rest of the game. I drop say that one drop white one one flyer, drop this turn two. I'm swinging in for two on turn two. In the, in the air, that's great. Um, I, I'm obviously gushing over this card, so just play it if you get it. Uh, Fleet Swallower is a kind of big blue land creature that we've gotten in a lot of sets. Five generic mana and two blue for a rare creature. It's a fish. It's a big old fish. It's not a leviathan or anything like that. It's a 6-6. Six, six. Whenever it attacks, target player puts the top half of his or her library, rounds it up into his or her graveyard. So, um, I love Mill. And I really want Mill to become a thing. It's not going to become a thing. You're going to win with this card because it's a 6-6 six, six before you win because it's milling your opponent, usually. Half is a lot. So you play this on turn 7. So your opponent has probably drawn 7 cards plus their additional 7. So they have roughly 26 cards left in their library. They put 13 in. Uh, next turn you attack with this, they put 7 in. Or they put 6 in. Um, 6 or 7. Math. <laughs> they put... Uh, so they still have another six turns, so you're going to win with this because A, either your opponent has to keep blocking it so they don't take six, or you're going to win because they keep taking six before the multiple turns it will take in order for this to mill them out. So I would still play it, don't get me wrong, this is your big booty seven drop in blue. Um, I'd still play it, but just remember you're not going to win because you're milling them with it. Probably. Um, Headwater Sentries is three generic mana blue for a common merfolk warrior, it's two five. Um, so you're the kind of, when you're playing the blue white flyers deck, again the blue X flyers deck, you do need creatures on the ground to block the the dinosaurs, the pirates, that kind of thing. And this is the kind of card you get for that. Turn four, it's it doesn't have a lot of power, but it's got a lot of toughness to block those aggressive creatures. Um, you can multi-block with this and something else. Well, your flyers maybe to kill a big five five or six six. 
Um, so it's, it's a good card for that. Uh, I'm not super pumped to open this, but this is kind of mid-pack, mid-late pack. It's like, oh, okay, that's, that's not bad. I'm not upset about getting this later on. Herald of the Secret Streams is 3 Jack mana blue. Very rare creature is a merfolk warrior. It's a 2-3. Creatures you control with plus one, plus one counters on them can't be blocked. Seems good. Um, there's a little little thing with this. Um, there's a white dinosaur that says whenever it takes damage, put a plus one, plus one uh, counter on every other creature you control. If you also then play this, that makes them all unblockable. That seems really good. So... I might just... There's other decks than the Merfolk deck that I would throw this into because of that. Merfolk aren't the only ones going to get plus one, plus one counters in this set, so because of that, I'm going to throw this in a few different decks, going to throw it around. So Herald of Secret Streams, um, I'd, I'd be happy playing and picking this guy, especially, just on its own, it's fine, um, especially if you have a lot of Explore. Explore is the mechanic that puts counters on things, mostly in this set. Um, but because of that, if you play this in your Explore deck 100%, uh, because unblockable is better than flying, and it just gives everything evasion the best possible evasion you can get. So just play this in your explore deck, play this in anything. If you have a few cards, like, say, four or five cards that say something about a counter going on them, and you have a Herald of Streams, Herald of Secret Streams, play it, and you will you might be happy with the results. Jace Cunning Castaway. Stupid, sexy Jace. <laughs> Jace Cunning Castaway is our new Jace for the set. Is this generic man and two blue for a mythic legendary planeswalker Jace? Note the rule change. All planeswalkers going forward have these super type legendary in addition to their other types, which means that I can play a Jace Cunning Castaway um, and any other Jace planeswalker because they're a different card. So I can have Jace Cunning Castaway, Jace Revealer, uh, or whatever of secrets, um, Jace the Mind Sculptor. I can have multiple Jaces out now. I, but however, I can only have one Jace Cunning Castaway out. If I play Jace Cunning Castaway and somehow, for some reason, I play a second one, I have to sacrifice the first one and be reduced down to only one Jace Cunning Castaway. Unless it says otherwise, like it does in his ultimate. Let's go through his abilities. Uh, so he costs generic and two blue, comes in at three loyalty. Three loyalty, turn three. This plus one says whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, this turn draw a card, then discard a card. So if something you control hits somebody, you get a loot. Um, you don't have to target anything, so it's just plus ones anyway, but... His minus two says create a 2-2 two, two blue illusion creature token with when this creature becomes the target of a spell, sacrifice it. Notice that illusions don't have the target of an ability thing anymore. So you minus two him, create an illusion, you plus one, and, um, or sorry, you say you pump your illusion that you created, or then you have to sacrifice because it's the uh, target of an ability. Uh, sorry, target of a spell. If you just target it with some kind of ability, though, you don't have to sacrifice it. Like, say, a creature enters the battlefield and says, oh, when this creature enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus two, plus two. That's an enter the battlefield ability, so then you then don't have to uh, sacrifice the illusion then, because it was just the target of the enter, field, enter the battlefield ability, not the actual creature, it's uh, spell, creature spell itself. Uh, his minus five is an ultimate, so pump him up twice and you get ult him. Uh, his ultimate says, create two tokens that are, a, that are copies of Jace Cutting Castaway, except they aren't legendary. So you can then get two planeswalkers, and those, each of those can split into two more planeswalkers, which can then do 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 um, So you can kind of make his own little army of illusions, which is kind of cool. Um, did see a little bit of play with him uh, in the pre-pre-release run by Loading Ready Run, and he was real good. Uh, usually dropped with yeah, one blocker, if not, if he's dropped into an empty board, what well, line of play I usually saw was he makes his illusion, then he starts plussing, and his illusion gets in and loots. Um, and if he can plus a few times after that, you know, create more illusions or just go for that ult depending on the board state. If you can get more blockers out and just keep, you know, plus oneing him and you make more targets for your opponent, so your opponent not only then has to worry about killing both chases that are each making, you know, illusions and making their own army and plusing and, you know, oh, this card's real good. I can see this making it into standard because I think every Jace has at least made it into, like, Grand Prix Top 8 before, so I don't see any reason this can't because it's an early Jace that gives you card selection, um, and can create its armies and split into more Jaces to create more problems. So I, I really want to see how many Jaces somebody can get on the board at once. Like, four, eight, sixteen Jaces? How many before you just win, right? Kopala, Warden of Waves, is one Jeric man and two blue for a 2-2 two -two rare legendary creature. He's a merfolk wizard. Uh, spells your opponent's control that target a merfolk you control. 
sorry, your spells your opponents cast that target a merfolk you control cost two more to cast. Abilities your opponents activate that target a merfolk you control cost two more to activate. So if it was a free ability, so if the ability said tap, kill that, it's now pay two, tap, kill that. Um, so again, in your draft deck, this is going to be really good. Um, in your sealed deck, you have to get enough merfolk in order for this to, to work, do some work for you. Um, so it might not be sealed, but draft could definitely make it. Uh, again, not this set. I don't think there's enough merfolk, but if the next set comes out, we get the kind of merfolk we've been getting already, then this could definitely uh, go into standard. I haven't played modern merfolk enough to know if this would be good enough. I don't think so. With my very, like, the three games I've played with modern merfolk. Um, might be sideboard. I can see it being sideboard against the right deck, but um, I don't think it's making main just based on my very limited experience. Lookout's Dispersal. Two generic mana and a blue for an uncommon instant. Costs one less to cast if you control a pirate. Counter target spell unless the controller pays four. Uh, in the pirate deck, this is killer. Um, late game, obviously it loses, you know, it's, it's impact late game. If an opponent plays a three mana spell with seven mana up, okay, they just get it. You don't even bother casting this at that point. But because it's a significant amount, uh, in the pirate deck, this is going to be real good. Lookout's Dispersal, anytime before turn 5, this just is says counter-target spell. Um, anytime before that. So for two generic mana and a blue, uh, ideally just one generic mana and a blue, this just says counter-target spell anytime in those first few turns, really. So I'm a big fan of Lookout's Dispersal. I'd play this in my blue, any kind of controly blue deck. Navigator's Ruin, two generic mana and a blue for a uncommon enchantment, has a raid trigger. At the beginning of your end step, if you attack with a creature this turn, target opponent puts the top four cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard. Now this is the kind of thing I would play this alongside um, that, like any kind of unblockable creature. The 2-1 that you can pay three to make it unblockable. So not only am I doing two every turn, but I'm also making you mill four every turn. Um, so that's this is the kind of mill card I can get behind because this is the kind of mill that I think you could win the game with. Also, if you, you know, do two ten times, you're also going to win. But this is the kind of mill card that I think could let you win. Uh, one with the wind is generic man in a blue for a common enchantment aura, enchant creature. Target uh, enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two, and has flying. Uh, so this is a essentially... Oh, ice playban, hexproof. Why can't I remember the name of that card? Spectral Flight... It had blue floaty skulls on it, and it was essentially this card. Um, somebody's gonna comment if you if you know what the card was I'm talking about. It's from Innistrad. It was generic blue. Target creature gets plus two plus two flying. Um, if you know the name of that card, please. I think it was Spectral Flight. Um, if you know the name of that card, please put it in the comments below. This this is real good. You play your one drop, and all of a sudden it's a three three flyer on turn two. That's just really good. Um, where I'm searching on my phone right now to see if that's the card. Spectral. It was Spectral Flight. This is an essential reprint of Spectral Flight. It was from, sorry, it was from, uh... Yeah. Yeah, it was from, it was, I was correct. It was, it's, this is an exact reprint, a functional reprint of that. Uh, Enchant Creature, Enchant Creature gets plus two, plus two, and has flying. So, uh, if that card was real good before, it's real good now. I would put this in any deck that has blue in it, honestly. Opt. It's real good. Uh, it's modern legal now, because uh, it was printed before 8th edition before, so opt is one blue for a common instant. It says, scry one, draw a card. One mana instant, draw. This is what we call a cantrip, folks. Not only that, but it's card selection. Look at the top card. Do I want to draw that? Not really. Bottom, draw random. Um, it's good. If you get one or two, play one or two. Um, yeah, do it. Uh, if I would play removal before I played opt, but... That's about it, really. Uh, any kind of, you know, blue tends to be a little more spell-heavy unless you're heavy blue-white flyers, but I love Opt. I would play with a copy or two of it very, very happily. Overflowing Insight uh, is the big blue splashy spell. Uh, it's four generic and three blue mana for a mythic sorcery. It says, target player draws seven cards. So, um, you know, if you watch any other set reviews, these big splashy spells... It's not going to be unheard of to get 7 mana in this format at all. Games aren't ending on turn 5 very often, um, despite the big aggressive dinosaurs we've all seen. 
overflowing insight is big and splashy, and there will be games where, you know, you've been stuck at five or six man all game with that in your hand, but the impact that this is going to have when you cast it is worth including, in my opinion, if you're playing a two-color blue deck. Three-color blue deck is a bit uh, pushed to play this because you got to have three blue producing three blue mana. So if you're playing blue, white, splash, black, and you're only playing like two or three black sources, then I'm probably okay with it, but it would be very heavy blue in order to play Overflowing Insight. Just make sure of that, because I don't want you to have eight lands out there and two islands with an Overflowing Insight in your hand to be real, real sad. So just make sure uh, you do your land base right if you're going to play Overflowing Insight, but I think it's worth including in your deck for the impact it can have. Uh, Perilous Voyage is generic mana and a blue for an uncommon instant. Return target non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. If its converted mana cost was two or less, scry two. Um, I'm playing this. I'm really happy about playing this. This bounces their planeswalkers. Um, if they're in, they have that one of the flip enchantments. It's going to bounce that. If they have uh, the pacify effect or Ixalan's binding, it bounces that, and you get your creature back. So I'm very happy about paying Perilous Voyage. Don't count on getting the two, the Scry 2 out of this. Just play it because it's a 2 mana bounce spell. Uh, again, like I said, this is kind of blues removal for limited, so play it. Be happy be happy about it. Pirate's Prize. Three generic mana to blue for a common sorcery. Draw two cards and create a colorless treasure artifact token. With tap sack, uh, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So this is okay. I'd rather play Opt than this. I'd rather play two copies of Opt than this, to be honest with you. Um... Like, yes, it does have the cost reduction to it in that you also get a treasure token. So if you play this with six mana, it essentially costs you three because you get a treasure and you have your two own lands on tap remaining, right? But even with that, eh, eh, like it's, at that point, it's divination. So this is a divination, basically. This is divination on turn four. <laughs> um, yeah, basically. So... A divination has been an iffy card before, so like I said, I would rather play Opt than this. So this is if I do play this, this is gonna be one of my last includes. Twenty to twenty-third card. Uh, if I decide to play Pirate's Prize, that's where I'm gonna put it. Your first few cards are gonna be your big bomb creatures, then your removal, then your value creatures, and maybe some pump or counters if you're playing blue instead or bounce. Uh, and then Pirate's Prize is gonna be one of my last includes. It's gonna be the ones I if I don't have great creatures and other stuff, this is gonna be something that just makes the cut. Prosperous Pirates, four generic mana and a blue for a 3-4 common human pirate creature. It says when Prosperous Pirates enters the battlefield, create two colorless treasure artifact tokens with tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. This I would play. Um, because it's A in blue with 3-4 for 5 is blue. Creatures are a little bit more of a cost in blue. Not only that though, but you know, on turn 5 you can play your Prosperous, Prosperous Pirates, get your two treasure, and keep up your bounce, two mana bounce spell. Or, um, you know, you have your pirate so you can keep up that, that the counter spell, right? So that's why I play value this significantly highly, uh, more highly than our, our last spell where it just said draw to, even though it was kind of overcosted, etc., etc., for a draw to. So I, I like Prosperous Pirates because it lets me possibly do two things on turn five. When, when the blue, the, in limited, it's often the first person to get to do multiple things in a turn tend to win, tends to win. And Prosperous Pirates is the kind of card that lets you start uh, beating your opponent for that because it gives you those treasures at the same time you got a pretty decent body on the board. River Sneak. Generic mana in a blue, it can't be blocked. So this is the kind of card that has that raid trigger. I'm attack for one, I'm going to mill you four. Uh, so it's an uncommon merfolk warrior for a 1-1, one, one, can't be blocked. Whenever another merfolk enters the battlefield under your control, it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. And so it's fine. These kinds of creatures can just win. And now this is going to be the primary target for a lot of your opponent's removal. If it's not, it means you're playing bigger threats and you're just going to keep pinging for one. Um, like I said, if you have that the enchantment that lets you mill for four with its raid trigger, this is the kind of card I want to set that off with. It's a little cheap thing I can play later in the game and just, okay, mill four, mill four, mill four. You're at 15 now and you've milled 20 cards. That's probably game in a turn or two. So uh, in that kind of deck, I like River Sneak, or again, the really heavy-duty Merfolk deck, uh, in draft, this is good, especially if you get that card whenever you play a merfolk, put another merfolk, because that means this is going to be a 3-3, three, three, because you play your merfolk spell and you got to create your token, um, so two merfolk have entered the battlefield under your control, so it gets plus one, plus one for each, so it becomes a 3-3 three, three unblockable, which is good. <laughs> uh, River's Rebuke is four generic mana and two blue for a rare sorcery, return all non-land permanents target player controls to their owner's hand. 
this is uh, the blue board wipe. Um, this wins you the game. Include this if you pull it. Um, in any kind of blue deck, like I said, we don't destroy things, we tend to bounce things. Um, or tap things. So this is our equivalent of a board wipe in the blue deck. If you open it, play it, and when you play it, you will probably win. Uh, like I said, we get board stalls in limited, in sealed. This will just let you win. This I can... I can possibly see making standard if somebody decides to go blue-black. Um, in standard, though, we have just kill spells and just board wipes, so those may beat this out because of that. But if a really heavy control deck comes out, I can see this this making it into that. So, run around, run aground. It's not run around. It's run aground. Uh, it's three dragon man and a blue for a common instant. Put target artifact or creature on top of its owner's library. So you're thinking, oh, this is bounce. Why is it so expensive? It's bad because it time walks them. Um, time walk is essentially they skip their turn because you took what they did on a previous turn and made it what they're going to do next turn as well. So if your opponent, for example, is top decking and you okay, put your mana rock back on top of your library. At the end of your, at the end of your turn, put what you just did on top of your library and you're gonna have to do it again now. That A give, gets rid of their blocker or whatever you're having trouble with of theirs for a turn, lets you hopefully get in for some damage, but also just literally skips their, essentially uh, skips their turn because they have to spend what they did last turn doing again. So I'd play a copy of Running Ground as well. Again, like I said, in our blue deck, big bombing creatures, removal, value spells, value creatures, and bounce. This goes in your bounce package. Sailor of Means, two generic mana blue for a common human pirate. It's a 1-4. Enters the battlefield, create a treasure. Um, so again, because this is essentially two mana on turn three, um, I can see playing it. This is our kind of thing we want to do against the aggressive decks. So we play this on turn three, we can leave up an opt, say, for the end of our opponent's turn. Uh, if we play it on turn four, we can leave up a bounce spell or our counter spell. Uh, so Sailor of Means, I do like in our kind of controly blue builds, is going to be a, a good card. I didn't include for that in our pirate decks, usually. So here's our flip card enchantment for blue. So Search for Azkanta is a generic man in a blue for a rare legendary enchantment that has, at the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. You may put it into the graveyard. Then, if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard, you may transform Search for Azkanta. So if you have Threshold. So if you play this late, last, uh, if you play this late game, you have to wait until um, your next turn because it has a then clause. So at the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library, you may put it in the graveyard. Then, if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard, so if I play this and I have ten cards in my graveyard, I have to wait until my upkeep, look at the card, I can put it in my graveyard if I want. Then, I transform this into... As Kanta the Sunken Ruin. It's a legendary land. It taps for a blue, as the, as lands do. It also has pay two and a blue. Tap. Look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a non-creature, non-land card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. That's real good. Uh, um, you get to look at the top four cards of your library. Pick, pick the best one Every at the end of every one of your opponent's turns. Um, that's exactly the thing blue wants to do. Blue wants card filtering, card draw, card selection... Blue wants to value you out because they're getting all the best cards out of their deck. And this is exactly what uh, the Sunken Ruin lets you do. And because it's so easy to set off, like this card, um, like we've just gone over the white one so far, uh, if you're watching these in order. So the white one, you had to attack with three creatures. Um, that might not happen. But when you're playing in blue, you will just have cards in your graveyard. Creatures will die, you'll cast spells, you'll draw and discard. You're just going to have spells in your graveyard from playing Magic. So this one will flip just because you played Magic. Um, so because that Azkant is one of the better ones, and then after you've just played Magic, you get to play better Magic than your opponent because you're hopefully getting all the best cards out of your deck. So this is a real good play if you got it. If you're playing blue at all, even if you're just kind of splashing blue, just play this. It's going to be worth it for you. Shaper Apprentice. Azkanta, I think it's going to get into standard. It's too good not to, in my opinion. Shaper Apprentice. Generic in a blue, a uh, very common merfolk wizard. It's a 2-1. Uh, it has Shaper Apprentice has flying as long as you control another merfolk. So again, we're, now we're getting merfolk with evasion. Same thing I've said about a lot of them. Um, on its own, a 2-1. If you're only playing a couple other merfolk, not worth it in my opinion. Just a generic 2-1 for 2. White gets 3-1s for 2. right? Um, but if you're playing merfolk heavy or drafting the merfolk deck, this is going to be a 2-1 flyer for 2, which is fine. So I would play it then, but not in a sealed deck in which you only have three or four other merfolk. If you're drafting and you have 
you know, 12 to 15 merfolk, definitely. If not, eh, I'm not super high on it. Shipwreck Looter is generic and a blue for a common human pirate. It's a 2-1. Raid. When it enters the battlefield, if you can, uh, if you attack with a creature this turn, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. Um, so again, in the blue deck, I would rather play this card than the Shaper Apprentice, because this one lets me, uh, lets me loot if I attacked with something. Um, so it has a possible upside, to me, more of an upside for card selection versus the other one where it might be a flyer. Probably not, but might be a flyer. So because of that, I like Shipwreck Looter a little better than the Shaper Apprentice. Uh, Shorekeeper is a blue mana for a 0-3 common trilobite creature. So this is our blue 8 mana tap ability. Uh, so for 7 mana and a blue, you can then tap and sacrifice Shorekeeper to draw 3 cards. Uh, late game, see, all the things are good again about doing what all the colors want to do in late game. Uh, the green one gives plus 5, plus 5, plus 5 trample to make a big thing bigger and trample over for damage. Uh, the white one pumps your entire team. The blue one draws cards, which is what blue wants to be doing in the late game. Um, in the control -y blue build, I'm going to play this to protect against, you know, pirates and early dinosaurs. In, like, my blue-white flyer build, I might play this to come up the ground, but I'm leaning more towards no, because blue-white flyer tends to be more aggressive. But for the most case, probably not playing this, but... If I'm hurting for one drops, I could. This is to me is the card that's going to be like 20 to 24th card in, or 20 to 23rd card in the deck. Um, drawing three cards is good, but I first and this is my personal playstyle as well. I want to be a little more aggressive than this thing lets me be. A siren Lookout, for example, um, is a two generic man and a blue for a common siren pirate. It has a one two with flying, and when it enters battlefield, explore. So you might find a land for your next turn, or it's going to be a 2-3 flyer for 3, which is great. Um, so yeah, I, I play a Siren Lookout in your blue-white flyer deck, not a problem there. Uh, same thing in your pirate deck, I would also play it as well, because evasion in any deck is good. And we can run Synergy because it's a pirate type. Um, also, this lets you get more raid triggers off your pirates, because it's evasion. It can often attack and be safer than a lot of other ground creatures. And it might also be a 2-3 flyer for 3, which is just a good body on its own. Siren's Ruse is a generic and a blue for a common instant. Exile target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. If a pirate card was exiled this way, draw a card. Um, so if we want to explore, then we can explore again. Uh, our last card, for example, and we get a draw a card with this. So uh, this is kind of counters your opponent's removal. If you have a really good uh, raid trigger, you can attack with it. Um, this resets your raid triggers as well, so you can attack with a creature get in for a couple damage, exile it, bring it back, and because it entered the battlefield and a creature attacked this turn, you get that raid trigger again, and you also get a draw card with Siren's Ruse. So again, this for me goes in my bounce slash counter removal, whatever you want to call it, package that is going to be in your blue deck. Siren Storm Tamer is a blue mana for a common 1-1 one -one flyer. It is a Siren Pirate Wizard. It also has for a blue mana, you can sacrifice it, a counter target spell or ability that targets you or a creature you control. This is going to be played. This is the one drop I want over the Trial of Bite. Um, granted, it's uncommon versus common, but this is one I want. Because it lets me counter something, and it lets me get in for damage, and it synergizes with the pirate deck. So it sets off raid triggers, sets off any, you know, end of the battlefield if you have a, own a pirate triggers. Um, it's going to go in my blue-white flyer deck, so this is going to be included in pretty much any blue deck that has blue in it wants a Siren Storm Tamer. Spell Pierce. If, you have, if you're newer to the game, and you haven't played with Spell Pierce before, you're going to play with it now. Congrats. Uh, blue mana is for a common instant counter-target non-creature spell unless its controller plays, pays two. Now, obviously, later in the game, this loses value. Um, but early in the game, if your opponent is on curve and they're curving out, oh, I hit five mana, i got to play my 5-5 five, five haste trample. Um, okay, well, you can do that then. Or, oh, so, oh I'm going to attack all of them with my, with my flyers, and they play that. They play that board wipe, because this is a non-creature spell. I made that mistake, sorry about that. Uh, if you're, you're attacking and they play the, that four mana um, Wrath wrath to Exile card, and then you can just spell pierce it. Nope, sorry. One blue mana, spell pierce says no. Um, or, you know, they want to on curve counter your thing, so spell pierce is a good card um, on curve. Don't let this sit in your hand. You often just want to counter the first non-creature thing your opponent plays. Um, because when you're sitting in a late game and your opponent's on 8 mana, this is just going to sit in your hand. You're like, spell pierce it, yeah, I'll pay 2. And it's not going to do anything. So the first impactful thing you can counter with spell pierce, do it. 
Um, because late game, this is just going to be sitting in your hand and dead, unfortunately. So, Spell Pierce is a good card. Just don't play too many of them. Because one in your opening hand is great, but one in your hand on turn 10 or, 10 or 12 is not that great. Spell Swindle, however, is great. Uh, three generic mana and two blue for a rare instant counter target spell. Create X colorless, cre uh, X colorless treasure artifact tokens, where X is that spells convert a mana cost. They have tap, sack this artifact, add one a mana, mana of any color to your mana pool. After turn five, this is often just going to be a quote unquote free spell because you're going to pay five for it, and what you're countering will often be five or more, and you'll get five treasures that you can then do something else with. Not only is there that card in this set that says if you control 10 of uh, the black card, if you control, I think it's 10 or more treasures, you win on your upkeep, I believe it says. Uh, it's a black card, we'll see it next. But this is just, you pay five for it, and then you still have five mana to do something else with. So this was really essentially free. Um, yes, it's five mana, and that's significant. But again, um, not having anything to do on turn five in limited isn't unheard of. So, yes, your opponent may suspect something because, hey, you're leaving five mana open, I'd suspect something too, but they're just, unless they're already really ahead on board, they're just going to have to play their spell, and you say no, and then you get mana because you said no. That's good. Spell Swindle, in my opinion, is good. I hope it gets into Constructed. I have thoughts I'm currently thinking about, about an Esper, so blue, black, white, uh, control deck with this and the black card... Um, that says if you have treasures, or the card from, I think it was Aether Revolt, that says if you control eight or more of the same ar artifact with the same name, you win. Um, I want to make a lot of treasures and win with treasures, because I own all the treasures. Uh, Stormfleet Aerialist is a generic man in a blue. For an uncommon human pirate, it's a 1-2 flyer, so this is going to go in your flyer deck, obviously, and even your pirate deck, because it has a raid trigger. This raid trigger says, when it enters the battlefield, it enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it if you attack with a creature this turn. Uh... So, yeah, so you drop your one drop uh, flyer, attack with it, play this on turn two, and you have a two three flyer. That's good. Um, Stormfleet Aerialist, I'm going to play in any deck that has blue in it. Pirate deck, blue white flyer deck. Yep. Stormfleet Spy, because uh, I'm not going on in depth on some of these, like super duper meta, just because they're good. They're, if I'm not going super in-depth and I say they're good, that's because they're good. Stormfleet Aerialist is just a good card. A 1-2 flyer on its own for two is fine. A 2-3 flyer, if you can get that, is great. And you're not always going to be playing this on turn two. You might be played on turn five or six, where, you, yeah, you've attacked with something, and then you play a 2-3 flyer. And maybe your opponent doesn't have any flyers, and now you're getting you're guaranteeing two damage a turn, right? So uh, Stormfleet Aerialist is a good card, and you should play it, and you should be happy that you're playing it. Stormfleet Spy is generic mana and two blue, sorry, two generic mana and one blue for an uncommon human pirate. It's a 2-2. Two -two. It's Raid Trigger says, uh, when it enters the, uh, the battlefield, if you attack with a creature this turn, draw a card. So three mana for a 2-2 two -two and drawing card is all right. Um, this would be one of my later includes, probably. Um, I personally want to be a little more aggressive. I don't play the, the Dural decks too, too often. I have nothing against them, but it's just not my play style. But in that kind of more controly blue deck, this is something you want to be doing. You attack with a little creature, maybe a token, a merfolk token or something, say. Um, vampire token, whatever you want to do. And you play this 2-2, you draw a card, you then play something else because it's like turn 7 or 8. So uh, Stormfleet Spy in that kind of controly blue deck is going to be something you want to play. Storm Sculptor for three generic mana and a blue is a common merfolk wizard. It's a 3-2 and it can't be blocked. Uh, when a Storm Sculpt when Storm Sculptor enters the battlefield, return a creature you control to its owner's hand. So this is something um, you can do with something that has a really good end of the battlefield trigger, say our last card. Stormfleet Spy. You play it, you draw your card, the next turn you play Storm Sculptor, you return it to your hand. On the next turn you attack with Storm Sculptor because it's unblockable, and you replay Stormfleet Spy, and you can draw another card. That seems like a pretty good little combo to me. Um, plus you've done unblockable damage, so hey. And you've drawn a couple cards, so that's the that's the kind of deck. Um, that's the kind of sealed deck you're gonna make with Merfolk, um, because it gives you that tempo play. The draft deck is gonna like this because it, it's just a good unblockable creature, uh, and it's Merfolk, so it's probably gonna be bigger and better than a 3-2 when you play it, and it might set off other things, so. Draft Merfolk deck this is gonna be good. Even a blue uh, tempo deck for regular sealed, this could be good as well. Tempest Caller is two generic mana and two blue for an uncommon Merfolk Wizard. It's a 2-3. When it enters the battlefield, tap all target creatures, tap all creatures target opponent controls. Um, this will win you the game. So, 
you often don't want to play this on turn four. Unless you really need a blocker, you don't want to play this on turn four. Because you want to play this when the boards reach that stalemate, you're both at less than ten, but you both have gummed up the ground with a bunch of creatures. You draw the Tempest Caller, you look, you, how many cards in hand? You ask your opponent, how many cards in hand? Oh, and you don't have any mana untapped, you're tapped out. Yeah, okay. Tempest Caller, tap your team, flunk, and you win. Um, so again, Tempest Caller, it costs four mana, but you're very rarely going to be playing on turn four. Uh, unless you have to, because you need a blocker to get in the way. Uh, but this is going to be, you play Tempest Caller, uh, you win. That's how this card is going to be a lot. So I like it because of that. This is my kind of blue card. The card, the kind of blue card that has a big impact when it enters. Um, so this is the kind of thing, if you do have to play this on turn four, you play your Storm Sculptor later, put it back in your hand, so you can then play your Tempest Caller again later when you have to tap your opponent's team and get in there for the win. That's one of the reasons I like Storm Sculptor so much. Uh, because Tempest Callers are the kind of thing I want to balance with it, and you, now you're starting to see that Merfolk synergy really get together. So in your draft deck, this is great. Um, even if my rare is meh, I would gladly take a Tempest Caller uh, first pick in a pack if I'm drafting as well. Sealed, this is the kind of card you don't have to play in a Merfolk deck in Sealed. Just play it because it's a big, impactful blue card that you can play late in the game. You can play this and then also keep up your Spell Pierce or your Counter Spell or something else later in the game to support it if your opponent tries to kill it or um, counter it on its way in. So Tempest Scholar is a good card and it'll just win you the game a lot. So play with it. Water Trap Weaver. It's two generic mana and a blue for a common Merfolk Wizard. It's a 2-2. When it enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. That creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. This is our blue semi-removal kind of thing. Like I said, blue taps or bounces. Um, so this is, again, good Merfolk card. Yes, you're paying three for a 2-2. Oh, no. But this is a functional reprint of Frostlinks, if you've been around for a while. Um, so... It's a good card. Frostlings was a great card in Limited. Water Trap Weaver is a great card in Limited. Play with it and you'll do well. Uh, it's kind of the mini uh, Tempest Caller because it taps one creature, your opponent's big thing, um, and it stays tapped for their turn as well. So it lets you get in with your stuff for two turns and prevents them from doing any damage to you for doing your big flunge swing in kind of thing. Uh, I'd gladly take a couple of Water Trap Weavers if I see them going around in draft or even include multiples of them in a kind of sealed deck that I do make on pre-release. Windstrider is for a generic mana and a blue for a 3-3 common merfolk wizard. It is flash and flying. Um, now, the other one we had was a 4-4 for this, and it did other things, but again, in her blue flyer deck, I'd be happy with this. Flash, the end of my opponent's turn, because like, okay, what are they holding up? Are they holding up a counter spell? Okay, I'm not going to play my big creature because they're going to counter it. Okay, maybe I do have a counter spell in my hand, maybe I don't, but because you chose not to play your spell, at the end of your turn, I'm going to flash in a Windstrider instead and send Pound you in the face for a couple turns in the air. Right? That's the kind of thing that uh, Flash creatures can do for you. So Windstrider, uh, again, play it in your Merfolk decks, play it in your Blue Flyer decks. I'd play this card in any deck that has blue in it, to be honest with you, because it's a good, solid card that, when you're playing blue, it gets in your opponent's minds, oh, crap, I can't, I can't play this because he might, might counter it. So Windstrider is the kind of card where you can take advantage of that, play into your opponent's fears. <laughs> So that was our last uh, Windstrider there, is our last blue card for Ixalan. Uh, what did you guys think of these cards? Um, are you excited for more folk possibly becoming a thing after the next set comes out? Because I'm excited for that. Uh, what do you think about these cards? Do you think they're good, better than I thought they were? Uh, do you think they're worse than I thought they were? What cards are you really excited about opening up for your pre-release? Um, I'm excited to hear your thoughts. Even if you're watching this after your pre-release, what did you pull any of these cards? How they do for you? Let me know. I want to have conversations with you guys down in the comments section below. If you like the video, please like, share, subscribe. Um, let everybody know what Gas City Game is about, what we're here to do. So I hope you guys have an awesome pre-release this upcoming weekend, as of filming of this, of course. I uh, hope to hear how you guys did. Please let me know again. Um, and yeah, I'm going to have fun with these cards. Hopefully you guys do, and I will see you again.